Over the past few days, there's been immense focus on Maulana Masood Azhar, the chief of the Jaish e Mohammed. For six years, Maulana Masood Azhar was incarcerated in an Indian prison. For the longest time, India's intelligence agencies did not even know the significance of the man they had with him because Maulana Azhar pretended to be a journalist, an ordinary foot soldier, a misguided youth. There were several attempts made to secure Maulana Azhar's release from prison. Over the next half hour, we will get you the most in-depth, incisive look into the life and times of a man who's hogged national media lime, limelight and mind space throughout the new year. We will start at the very beginning. Maulana Masood Azhar telling his interrogators about how he was initiated into the world of jihad. This is an India Today national exclusive. The image of Maulana Masood Azhar being escorted by Jaswan Singh and Ajit Doval to Kandahar in Afghanistan is a scar etched in the collective memory of India. Azhar had been arrested from Kashmir, booked under Tada and housed at the Kot Bhalwal Central Jail in Jammu. During his six-year incarceration, Azhar spent many hours being interrogated by officials from India's security forces. He told them about his early life, his initiation into the world of jihad and his steep climb up the hierarchy of the Kashmir terror factory. India today has been able to access the interrogation reports of Masood Azhar in which he narrates his life story. Maulana Azhar was born in Bhawalpur in Pakistani Punjab on the 10th of July 1968. His father, Allah Bak Shabir, was a headmaster at a local government-run school. His family operated a dairy and poultry farm. When he was in the 8th standard, his father's friend, Mufti Saeed, persuaded Azhar's father to let his son study at the Jamia Uloom Ul Islamia in Karachi. Here he found himself in the company of students who were under the influence of leaders of the Harkatul Mujahideen or the HUM, a terrorist organization which was active in Afghanistan at the time. Azhar passed the Almiya or the Islamic exam with distinction in 1989 when he was 21. At an age when most youngsters are confused about their future, Azhar was crystal clear. He had been deeply influenced by Harkatul Mujahideen leaders and many of his fellow students from Sudan, Bangladesh and Pakistan had already left to wage jihad in Afghanistan. Azhar met Maulana Fazlur Rehman Khalil, the chief of the HUM, who directed him to proceed for tarbiyat or training in jihad, the holy war. Azhar told interrogators he went to Yuvar, a training camp in Afghanistan. Yuvar soon turned into a nightmare for the young Masood Azhar. He had immense difficulty when it came to obstacle courses and weapons training. He was pudgy, stood at 5 feet 3 inches and just could not cross the trenches filled with water. His gun could not aim at the target. His heavy frame would not allow him to compete. His peers made fun of him. Some called him Motu. Azhar was dejected. He could not complete the mandatory 40-day training program. He told his interrogators he almost gave up plans of becoming a jihadi. His handlers realized that Azhar would be of no use in the battlefield. He was sent back to the Jamia Islamia in Karachi. Here he took up a job as a teacher. His knowledge of Islam and his literary skills soon saw him bringing out a magazine, the Sadai Mujahideen or the Knock of the Mujahideen. The magazine carried articles on the exploits of the Harkatul Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Free copies were distributed after Friday prayers. The Sadai Mujahideen turned out to be a super hit. Its propaganda material helped lure many a new recruit into the world of jihad. Azhar impressed his boss, HUM chief Fazlur Khalil, with his ability to edit a rousing magazine. Azhar's other great skill, which made a deep impression on the HUM Supremo, 
was his ability to make impassioned speeches and motivate youngsters to join the world of jihad. Soon the stodgy Masood, who failed his terror training, turned into a star, an ace motivator, a brilliant orator. A new department of motivation was set up under Masood Azhar. The world of terror had found a new star. So how did a man who started out as a journalist end up heading the Jaish e Mohammed? How did he come to India in the first place? His interest, remember, initially was only in Afghanistan. He's a Pakistani by birth. Sit back and watch now part two of this India Today special report on the making of Maulana Masood Azhar. By 1992, Maulana Masood Azhar had established himself as a journalist, editing the Sadai Mujahideen and collecting funds for his comrades in Afghanistan. Harkatul Mujahideen Chief Khalil encouraged the Maulana to expand the scope of his work by undertaking foreign tours, make speeches and collect funds. Azhar travelled to Saudi Arabia for Hajj and was able to collect 3 lakh rupees in a matter of days. He travelled to Zambia in Africa where he stayed for a month. Here again he collected 2.2 million rupees. His next destination was the United Kingdom, where he visited Birmingham, Nottingham, Leicester and London. Here too he won many friends, influenced people and gathered huge sums of money for the Jihad factory. Azhar's stock rose rapidly in the eyes of his bosses. They realized this was no ordinary terrorist but a very special ideologue. Azhar was asked to go to Pakistan-occupied Kashmir to meet Sajjad Afghani. Sajjad was a sharpshooter who had performed well in the battle against the Russians. They met in January 1993, a month after the demolition of the Babri Masjid in India. Azhar told interrogators that the demolition of the Babri Masjid infuriated him no end and he decided to wage war against India. Azhar travelled to POK, addressing public meetings and speaking about the need to liberate Kashmir from India. In 1994, Azhar was asked to go to Indian Kashmir and boost the morale of the Mujahideen. Azhar flew on a Portuguese passport to Dhaka and from there he travelled to Delhi. When he landed at the Indira Gandhi International Airport, his name was Adam Isa, a Portuguese national of Gujarati origin. Azhar checked into the famous Ashoka Hotel for the night. Before going to Jammu, he wanted to travel to Lucknow and from there to Ayodhya. Azhar travelled to the disputed site and narrated his experience to his interrogators. I remember the day I was standing there. In front of me lay the Babri Masjid in ruins. Angrily, I was stamping the ground with my shoes and saying, O oh Babri Masjid, we are sorry. You were a sign of our glorious past and we will not rest till we restore you to your former glory. These lines went on to become a part of every speech Azhar gave from that day on to motivate Harkat Kada. By the time Azhar went to Srinagar, he developed an image as a renowned Islamic scholar who had travelled to 25 countries propagating jihad and collecting funds. His first meeting or the Majlis e Jihad was in Anantnag. 70 kilometers from Srinagar. Azhar told his interrogators about 25 armed Mujahideen gathered at a small house in the village. The young men's chests were decorated with magazines. All of them were listening to me intently with their AK 47s cradled in their arms like children in their mother's care. Azhar added, I picked up a Klashnikov and after feeling the weapon in my hands, found that it was ready to talk to the Mushrikeen or enemy. The bullet was in the chamber and it was ready to fire. I was ecstatic at the thought of the enemy soldiers falling. My joy knew no bounds as I held the loaded gun in my hands. Azhar had spent only two days speaking to the Mujahideen in the valley. He was looking forward to Friday when he was to deliver prayers at the famous Jama Masjid. But that day, as he and a colleague Sajid travelled to the Masjid, their car broke down. The duo tried to hail an auto rickshaw but that is when they were arrested by the Indian forces. This was a deadly blow to Azhar's handlers in Pakistan. The man who'd been sent to help win independence in Kashmir had been arrested even before his mission had truly begun. Luckily for Azhar though, 
Indian agencies had no idea about the man they just picked up. For them, he was an ordinary terrorist, one of the many misguided Kashmiri youth who had picked up the gun against India. Immense disturbance in Pakistan about the fact that their star preacher had been arrested within two days of him reaching the Kashmir Valley. They were desperate to get him out of prison. Not one, not two, but multiple attempts were made where ISI handlers told their operatives to kidnap foreign nationals with the intent of getting Maulana Masood out of jail. There was also an attempt to break through by digging a secret tunnel inside Jammu. Maulana Masood Azhar went into the tunnel which had been dug by his fellow uh, terrorists but found that it was too narrow for him because he's a bit bulky. So he said, no, this is not going to work. Let me now get you part three of this India Today national exclusive. A master motivator, Maulana Masood Azhar's mind was more dangerous than a Kalashnikov, his words more lethal than bullets. The Pakistani establishment was in panic and desperate to devise a strategy to secure Azhar's release. But in India, the Intelligence Bureau and the Research and Analysis Wing were oblivious to the significance of the man they had caught. For months, Azhar was questioned by different officers. He played dumb, pretending to be a journalist. At that time, India knew no better. Despite sustained questioning, Azhar did not break. Shockingly, the interrogating officer from Kashmir's counter-intelligence wing concluded his report by saying that Azhar was himself not involved in any terrorist activity in Kashmir. On the other side of the LOC though, a plan had been hatched. Within months of Azhar's arrest, in June 1994, the Harkatul Ansar kidnapped two British nationals while they were trekking near Pahalgam. Among the demands placed by the kidnappers was the release of Maulana Masood Azhar. The plan though fell flat, but the ISI did not give up. The next time, Omar Sheikh was sent to India. Omar was later involved in the infamous kidnapping and death of Wall Street journalist Daniel Pearl. Omar's brief was to kidnap foreigners and secure the Maulana's release. Born and brought up in England, Omar was educated at the London School of Economics. He managed to befriend an American and three British tourists and kept them chained at a safe house on the outskirts of Delhi. But he too was nabbed by the police. Pakistan did not give up. In 1995, five more foreigners were arrested by the Al Faran, a front for the Harkat Ul Ansar. The name that topped the list of the terrorists that the kidnappers wanted freed was Maulana Masood Azhar. It was only now that the agencies began to realize the importance of the man they had in their custody. Azhar was so important that even the Pakistani High Commission officially sought his release on the grounds that he was a journalist. In June 1999, there was a riot in the Jammu prison in which Maulana Masood was lodged. The riot started after a daring escape effort by foreign and local militants. Sajjad Afghani and other terrorists had managed to secretly dig a tunnel. Azhar checked out the tunnel but came out after going in six feet because he felt that the tunnel was too narrow for broad people like him. The escape bid failed. Sajjad was killed in the firing. Sajjad's killing pressed alarm bells in Pakistan. The ISI feared that Azhar too may be killed. By now, his Pakistani handlers were desperate. They began planning to hijack an aircraft from Kathmandu to Kandahar. The hijacking of IC-814 was one of the low points in India's battle against terrorists. Investigators now believe that the principal reason behind that dramatic hijacking was to secure the release of Maulana Masood Azhar, who was locked away in Jammu since their attempts to kidnap foreigners hadn't yielded results. The ISI activated the most dramatic plan and ensured that IC-814 was hijacked from, Kandahar, from Kathmandu ultimately to Kandahar where Maulana Masood Azhar had the opportunity to meet Mullah Omar and a man named Osama Bin Laden on the same day that they were freed by Ajit Doval and Jaswan Singh. This is part four of this India Today national exclusive.
On the 24th of December 1999, Indian Airlines flight IC814 was hijacked as it made its way from the Tiruvuvan International Airport in Kathmandu to the IGI Airport in Delhi. At 5.30 p.m., just as IC814 had entered Indian airspace, terrorists from the Harkatul Mujahideen commandeered the plane. After touching down in Amritsar, Lahore and Dubai, the hijackers forced the plane to land in Kandahar in Afghanistan. Kandahar at that time was under the control of the Taliban. The hijackers released 27 of the 176 passengers in Dubai. They fatally stabbed one and wounded several others. The hostage crisis played itself out on national television for seven excruciatingly long days. The hijackers were demanding the release of three terrorists, Maulana Masood Azhar, Mushtaq Ahmad Zargar and Omar Sheikh. The Indian government was under immense pressure. Relatives were protesting at the Prime Minister's house. In Kandahar, Taliban fighters had surrounded the aircraft to prevent any attempt by Indian commandos to storm the plane. The clock was ticking. Terrorists had given an ultimatum. They would kill all the hostages if their demands were not met. The Vajpayee government relented. External Affairs Minister Jaswan Singh and Intelligence Bureau Chief Ajit Doval escorted three dreaded terrorists, Masood Azhar, Omar Sheikh and Mustaq Zargar to Kandahar and handed them over to the Taliban. Azhar later described his flight to freedom. The plane was flying high and heading for Pakistan. I turned to look back and caught the curiosity-filled glance of Mushtaq Zargar. Another Mujahideen commander, Omar Sheikh, was sitting a few rows ahead of me. Each of us had three guards around us. Jaswan Singh, the minister of Bharat, sat in the first row. He had a physician who gave him some tablets. The cabinet crew offered us refreshments, but we refused. We were neither hungry nor thirsty, but lusting for freedom. The historic moment arrived when the plane started descending. Azhar added, The runway flashed by and I was a mixture of emotions. Mullah Umar, the person whose deep love filled my heart, lived here in Kandahar. When I was in prison, I desperately yearned to kiss the hand of Mullah Umar. I felt like breaking the door of the plane and running out like a madman on the tarmac. As soon as my feet touched the ground, my heart was transformed. Taliban officials greeted us at the foot of the stairs. As I watched mesmerized, two masked men came down with the use of a rope and hugged me. My eyes welled with tears. I could not help thinking that I was arrested on a Friday and released on a Friday. The day they landed in Kandahar, Azhar and Omar Sheikh went and met Mullah Omar and his special guest, a man named Osama Bin Laden. They reached Pakistan a week later. On 31 January 2000, exactly a month after touching down in Kandahar, Masood Azhar announced the formation of the jaish e Muhammad. He addressed 1,000 armed followers at a mosque in Karachi. Azhar was the motivator and fund collector. Zargar helped him recruit local Kashmiris. Omar was the arms instructor. Their motto, Jihad is Worship. The men who had been let off from an Indian prison went on to form one of the most dangerous terrorist outfits whose sole motive is to hurt India's interests. In the spring of 2000, just as the snow was beginning to melt and flowers were blooming in the Kashmir Valley, an audacious attack changed the face of terrorism in India forever. A 17-year-old schoolboy from downtown Srinagar, Afaq Ahmed, blew himself up in an explosive-laden Maruti outside the gates of the 15 core headquarters. Afaq Ahmed was the valley's first human bomb, and this attack marked the start of a new phase of terrorism in Kashmir. Within weeks of setting up the Jaish e Muhammad, Maulana Masood Azhar had announced his deafening arrival in the world of terror. It was on the 31st of December 1999 that Maulana Masood Azhar was freed from an Indian jail. Exactly a month after the day he was freed, Masood Azhar announced the setting up of the Jaish-e-Muhammad or the Army of Muhammad. 
The first training camp was set up at Balakot in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. Masood had two key aides, Omar Sheikh and Mushtaq Zargar. Omar was an arms instructor trained in the use of small and heavy weapons. Zargar was earlier the head of the Al Umar and had a wide network of contacts in the Kashmir Valley. He helped recruit local Kashmiris for the Jash. Azhar was the main motivator and funds collector. Together, they formed the most deadly terrorist organization that had ever attacked India. According to Indian intelligence agencies, the Jashe Mohammed carried out more than 100 attacks on security forces and strategic installations across India. The most deadly of these attacks came on 1st of October 2001, when militants belonging to Jashe Mohammed carried out an attack on the Jammu and Kashmir State Legislative Assembly complex in Srinagar. They used a Tata Sumo loaded with explosives, ramming it into the main gate with three Fedayin suicide bombers. 38 people and three Fedayins were killed in this attack. Soon after, on 13th of December 2001, the Jash combined with the lashkar e taiba to attack the symbol of Indian democracy, its parliament. Six Delhi police personnel, two parliament security service personnel and a gardener were killed while battling the five terrorists. The attack on parliament sparked a nationwide outrage. The Vajpayee government launched Operation Parakram. India and Pakistan almost went to war because of the evil designs of Masood Azhar. Under pressure from then US President Bill Clinton, Pakistan President General Parvez Musharraf was forced to ban the bank accounts of the Jash. Masood was taken into custody. Parvez Musharraf had decided to side with the Americans in the battle against the Taliban. This led to much anger amongst the terrorists who owed moral allegiance to the Taliban. There was a split in the Jash in late 2001. One group affiliated with Maulana Abdul Jabbar decided to train their guns on Pakistan. In 2003, Jash operators were involved in an assassination attempt on the life of General Musharraf. In July 2007, the group was involved in the standoff between army and jihadists who had occupied the Lal Masjid in Islamabad. From 2001 to 2002, Masood Azhar remained under preventive custody. He stayed loyal to his handlers in the Pakistani state. But his cadre was getting increasingly restive. Many split to join the Lashkare Jangvi. Jash elements were part of spectacular attacks on the Pakistani state, including attacks on the Pakistan Air Force stations. It was in December of 2014 that the ISI decided that it wanted to revive the Jash to ensure that the guns of the army of Muhammad would continue to point towards India rather than have them attack Pakistan. It was as part of this strategy that the Jash attacked the Patan Court Air Base at the beginning of this year. Amidst conflicting reports over whether he has actually been detained or not, Masood Azhar remains one of the most potent threats to India. With Rahul Kaval, this is Bureau Report for India Today.